This video is brought to you by Captivating History. In the modern age, wars are rarely fought for the sake of chivalry, freedom, or the right of self-determination, and to pretend otherwise would be ingenuous. For the most part, wars today are fought for the sake of profit, economic, strategic, or some other self-serving gain. This never seems relevant during the war, but often becomes evident in retrospect. One such case is the Treaty of Versailles which brought about the end of the First World War. For six months in 1919, the world watched Paris, from the beginning of January to the end of June. Beady eyes, restless legs, obsessive disposition, and a paranoid demeanor all focused on the political dealings happening in France. Paris has been home to many significant events in modern history. From the mid-1600s to the 20th century, Paris was somehow involved with almost every social revolution, political ideology, cultural revision, or artistic movement. Out of all the monumental historic events that have graced the city, the end of the First World War is certainly one of the most significant ones. The Treaty of Versailles ended the war to end all wars, but it would end up causing more wars than it had hoped to cease. The result of the treaty was crucial to the events leading up to and including World War II. The German government had asked U.S. President Woodrow Wilson to intervene and arrange a general armistice in 1918. Wilson laid out his ideal vision of a post-war world. He emphasized that the various ethnic groups of Europe should have their right to self-determination and proposed the formation of an international association of different nations. This organization, which eventually came to be known as the League of Nations, would serve to solve disputes and avoid international conflict that would potentially lead to a global war. The main American objective was to maintain peace in the region so as not to disturb the relations among the Western world. He put forth 14 points that summarized the steps required for achieving these goals. Here's a summary. 1. Diplomatic affairs should be public and treaties should not be signed in secret. 2. The right to freely navigate the seas should be extended to all nations. 3. All nations should enjoy free trade with each other. 4. To avoid future plight and suffering, all countries should work towards reducing their weapons. 5. Colonial issues should be treated impartially. 6. Russian territories should be given back. 7. Alsace-Lorraine is returned to France, at which point France should enjoy complete freedom and autonomy. 8. Belgium should gain independence. 9. Italy's frontiers should be drawn according to the recognizable national lines. 10. Austrian-Hungary people should have the right to self-determination. 11. The Balkan states should have the right to self-determination. 12. The Turks should have the right to self-determination. 13. Poland should be independent. 14. An international association of nations should be formed to avoid further global conflict. The Germans believed that the vision outlined by Wilson would shape the future of the Western world, so they signed the armistice on 11th November 1918. Unfortunately, it was not to be, and the later negotiations were long-winded and patience-bearing. The Treaty of Versailles was part of the diplomatic conference held between the leaders of the Allied forces and Germany at the Palace of Versailles. These negotiations are usually known as the Paris Peace Conference. The Germans had managed to seize the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine from France during the Franco-Prussian War. The Paris Peace Conference began on 18th January 1919, a significant date because it marked the coronation anniversary of German Emperor Wilhelm I after the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. So, the French motives were always questionable, as they favored revenge and retaliation more than just peace. The French had lost 1.3 million soldiers and around 400,000 civilians. France witnessed some of the worst physical destruction in the war, and now they wanted to avenge their losses, and then some. The French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau saw the loss of Alsace and Lorraine as humiliating and wanted to see the territory under French control again. Clemenceau was particularly concerned about the future of the French populace. Having undergone severe losses, they could not afford another war with Germany. He wanted to neutralize the threat altogether, 
and the simplest way to do so was to ask for reparations. America was so far away that it was under no immediate threat. England was fairly protected as well, but the French feared an invasion across the Rhine. Financially, Britain had suffered tremendously, but had little in the way of physical losses. Temperatures were running high among the British public, and they wanted to subject the Germans to mob justice. The British Prime Minister was not fond of the vengeful instinct that had overtaken not just his nation, but France as well. He understood that Germany as a state was not going to vanish, and at some point a compromise should be in order. Germany was one of the strongest economic forces in the world before the war. To think that the German public would accept such a sudden shift was slightly insulting. Furthermore, he knew that Europe, as a continent, needed to maintain some sense of equilibrium. By economically crippling the Germans, the French wanted to establish economic dominance over the region. As such, he wanted to hit two birds with one stone, punish the Germans just enough that they could bounce back. Too much and the French take over, too little and the German threat reappears. A somewhat revived Germany would also work as a deterrent to the Bolsheviks in the East. Italy was not as agitated and consequently not too stern with the Germans. The Italian statesman Vittorio Emmanuel Orlando wanted to partition the Habsburg Empire, a familial dynasty that had continued to rule significant parts of Europe for the past few centuries. He wanted the British and the French to achieve a compromise. He negotiated some territorial gains to Italian colonies, which the Italian nationalists found too little a reward for fighting the Germans in the war. As pressure mounted, Orlando resigned. Francesco Severio Nitti took his place and ended up signing the Treaty of Versailles. The Allies had stated that if Germany were not to accept the terms of the finalized treaty, the war would continue, annihilating Germany in the process. David Lloyd George, Vittorio Orlando, and George Clemenceau dominated the conferences, and the defeated nations, Austria-Hungary, Turkey, Bulgaria, had no representation. Russia was foregone as well. The Russians had backed the Allies, but had withdrawn from the conflict when the Bolshevik government decided to make peace with the Germans. Looking back at the process, the problem is obvious. The French wanted to gain the upper hand by limiting German expansion. The Brits wanted to establish Germany as a viable trading partner, and the Italians wanted to expand their influence by absorbing new territories. Everyone had a self-serving agenda aimed at short-term gratification. The U.S. was not in Europe, so it did not have a personal stake. However, Wilson's ideas, naive as they would have seemed, could have been a ploy to maintain America's trade relations across different parts of Europe. In the end, the Allies imposed harsh penalties on the Germans, which included giving up their land, demilitarization of the Rhine, suspension of the Air Force, limitations on the Army and the Navy, and forfeiting its overseas possessions. On 28 June 1919, the fifth anniversary of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, Germany signed the treaty. The treaty stripped Germany of 7 million people and 25,100 square miles of land. The Germans had to accept Czechoslovakia's sovereignty and concede many provinces and cities that lay beyond their borders. The treaty's purpose was to stop Germany from mounting a colossal assault again, and as such, their military was rendered incapable of offensive warfare. The Germans were forced to demobilize several of their soldiers, leaving an army of 100,000 men in seven divisions of infantry and three divisions of cavalry. Military schools, the police force, and private and non-commissioned soldiers were also limited. Article 231 made Germany accept responsibility for the death and destruction caused by World War I, and a commission was created to establish the exact amount of the reparations. Germany had to pay almost 20 billion gold marks, which translates to around $5 billion. They would pay this in gold, ships, commodities, and other forms. These sanctions served to debilitate the already destroyed Germany. In 1921, it was assessed that the total cost of reparations, both direct and indirect, was around 132 billion gold marks, which translates into $31 billion. The figure is equivalent to around $416 billion today. The British bureaucracy and the Foreign Office had a mixed reaction to the treaty. They thought that the French were biting off more than they could chew and that it would come back to bite them. 
They realized that the French wanted to gain influence in Europe. It did not hurt that the vengeance and political ambitions ran parallel to each other. They inferred that the French would go to any lengths in their hunger for power even if it meant keeping the entire region in a constant state of flux. On the other hand, the British public hated the Germans after being at war for years and was quite pleased with the result of the treaty. Germany's decline was their payback. The French danced and sang in an uproarious manner as the treaty had been most agreeable for their side. But the initial mood of jubilee gave way to civil unrest. The liberal elements of the French society proclaimed that the punishments were far too severe. The conservative factions argued that the treaty was way too lenient. The U.S., in the end, did not ratify the treaty and had to establish a separate peace treaty with the Germans. Italy had the worst reaction to the treaty, and the public considered it a blunder. They had paid a huge price for the war and had managed to gain a few territories. Over the years, historians and economists have highly criticized the Treaty of Versailles, labeling it selfish, ill-conceived, and greedy. The reparations were too high, and no one believed that Germany could pay them. Some economists think that the European economic model would have collapsed if the reparations had been paid in full. The after-effects of the treaty were highly consequential for the European landscape in the mid-20th century. The resolution, or lack thereof, had left the Italians bereft. They felt that they had not received their due share and started to aspire to the true grandeur of Italy. This nationalist perspective gave birth to the reign of Benito Mussolini, who ended up inspiring Adolf Hitler in his fascist ambitions. Mussolini came into power as a dictator three years after the treaty and imposed his brand of justice and honor. In Germany, conditions kept declining. The first democratic leader after the war refused to sign the treaty and resigned. Eventually, the Germans caved in, as the threat of an invasion on the Western Front was too big a risk. The dissatisfaction of the public was at an all-time high. We know what happens when people are desperate for change. They appoint populists with rigid ideals to guide them. The Weimar Republic was an experiment in democracy that did not survive long. The economic stress from the Treaty of Versailles was too big to ignore. The public was disinterested in puritanical ideas since they saw the Allied forces as thieves who deemed the Germans to be their slaves. In essence, the economic conditions were not viable to sustain a democracy. The public had no interest in slaving their lives away in subjugation. The constant anxiety was too much to bear, and in a bit of desperation, or maybe hope, the Germans willingly gave power to Adolf Hitler, who painted a different future and promised to give them their due right. To learn more about the Treaty of Versailles, check out our book, The Treaty of Versailles, a captivating guide to the peace treaty that ended World War I and its impact on Germany and the rise of Adolf Hitler. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while they're still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.